and we're joined by our first guest tonight, the fabulous Julian Clary. Look. <laughs> now, I linked you to it because, of course, there's this brilliant new documentary celebrating the very much loved Paul O'Grady, which yeah. is on on Easter Friday. And of course, we knew that Paul was super kind, gave a lot of money to charity. But in this documentary as well, the thing that shocked me was that, you know, he used to be a social worker and would then do Lily in the night and he looked after all sorts of children. He said to me at one point, I was like a bad Mary Poppins. <laughs> he was just full of um, natural kindness and yeah. random generosity, you know, as well as the big charities. I think he was, he didn't talk about it, but he was always helping people, the, the values he grew up with, I guess. Yeah. And he, he was kind, very kind to me as well, um, not that I was an underdog, but when I moved in nearby him, he, he came around with a basket full of eco-friendly cleaning products and a shepherd's pie, and the house was very cold. The next day, a lawyer arrived with a vintage 1920s Rayburn oven on it, warmed the whole house up. No. Oh, wow. Amazing. Oh, that is so nice, it's isn't special, it? Isn't it? And you know, in the documentary, we get a real insight from people like yourself and Graham Norton on Paul, but also we hear from people like his daughter Sharon, and she talks about growing up with Lily yeah. as her dad. Let's have a look. See, I, I wasn't allowed to see a lot of Lily when I was little. I think because of the language, and I didn't understand a lot of the jokes anyway. I was about seven. I was having a birthday party. And my dad said, oh, I've got a great surprise for you. Swallows this fluid and then starts fire eating in my mum's little flat. You know, and then there were sort of scorch marks on the ceiling. All the girls were screaming, cos like, ah, oh, it's a fire, it's a fire! You know, I was mortified, but he thought he was like, and he's doing all this and he's like blowing fire. Like, <laughs> I'm seven, I wanted like a clown. How <laughs> oh, good is that? Honestly. Absolutely brilliant. Um, now, his sister also talks about an old library book that she found that had some sketches in, yes. actually, some very special sketches, and that's something that you can relate to, Julian. Well, what, what they found in an old library book was he was doodling, and it's, it was like a sort of premonition of the future, pictures of a very lily-like oh, right. head. And I, when I saw it, I said, oh, I used to do these doodles as well, of, of a face which is very like my kind of on-stage face, the same kind of makeup, and. Uh, we make of that what we will, whether, you know, it's all preordained or they're... It's like a vision that you would seen, yeah. essentially. Yeah. One day a scientist will explain it all to us, yeah. I guess. Yeah, and we were both saying how great an artist Paul was. Yeah. He you was... know, you see these sketches and they're really good, don't they? Well, doing all that makeup, that is art, you know, it's a form of art and yeah. he had beautiful handwriting. So, and he, he was very, actually, had very good taste. I don't know why I'm surprised. <laughs> 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 Now, in the documentary as well, we hear about how Paul, you know, he was Lily and he decided to stop doing Lily really at the height of Lily's fame. Was that something he was nervous about or do you think he felt it was time? He felt it was time and he was the sort of person that would, would make a decision and stick to it. You know, he was very sure of his path, I think, and, and so he didn't have any doubts about that. And I think he discovered that he could be just as funny as Paul and um, having been liberated by Lily, he was then liberated by yeah. not doing Lily and being himself. Um, well, we've got to talk to you about your new tour mm. as well, Julian. You're back with a new tour. Um, what is it about kind of like being out there on stage and performing that you kind of enjoy most? It's the kind of magic of... Cos you can spend ages writing a show and then you rehearse it, but something happens when you're on stage where ideas come into your head and it's... it's improvise but then over the course of a few nights that becomes a whole yeah. new section and you can't practice that it can only happen when you're on stage in front of however many people and we saw the poster and it looks like it's got sort of a western yeah. sort of theme western and you know vibes, yeah. beyonce she's released that western -y single taylor, you know, swift. taylor swift all yeah, of that there you go. is there any singing in this <laughs> yes it's very on trend isn't it rawhide i thought i'd do that nice. but once i had the idea of a western everything you know comes with it i've got the costume i've got the songs i've got the <laughs> magnificent seven and all this so um yes i can't wait brilliant we look forward to yeah. seeing you in a stetson Thank you. Soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, well, the life and death of Lily Savage is on Good Friday at 9 p.m. on ITV1, uh, and you can see Julian on tour from next month. 
Now, in a moment, we're going to be joined by Gareth Malone, who will be telling us all about his latest amateur choir and a very special performance he's been getting them ready for this Easter. Yes, and we all know that Gareth loves a challenge, <laughs> uh, but this one apparently has pushed him to the limit. Nervous? Only in that one. I'm looking for eight people who will be coming to Bach for the very first time. Keep going. Okay. At all costs. Their task is to perform alongside Britain's only full-time professional chamber choir, the BBC Singers. Sweaty? <laughs> yeah, just a little. It's going to be a challenge for me, it's going to be a challenge for them, that's for sure. This is incredibly dramatic, incredibly human and incredibly beautiful, but it is a terrifying prospect. <laughs> Well, Gareth Malone is with us now. Hi, Gareth. How are you? Come on, hey. <laughs> so we saw a little taster there from the first episode and then it culminates with a big concert, which we can see on Easter Sunday night, yes. evening, then I should say. You say this is your biggest challenge to date. It, it is. It is literally the longest piece of music that I've conducted yeah. on television. It's a, a great work of choral music by Bach. Um, which is, I think, just one of the most beautiful, moving, deep, gorgeous pieces of music that, well, that I've ever had the privilege to stand uh, in front of uh, and conduct. I'm very excited. Now, and when you actually put the call out to the choir to yes. gather them together to assemble this incredible choir that you—they didn't have a clue. What no, they were I didn't into, tell did them they? anything. I think they thought that they would be turning up and singing in a two and a half minute Adele song, <laughs> and I whacked this giant score and said, "We're going to be doing yeah. this." Um, and they happily, they, they all went for it. And not only are we doing it uh, with uh, this giant work, we're doing it with the BBC Singers, we're doing it with the BBC um, oh. uh, National Orchestra of Wales, we're doing it on, sort of on a grand scale. So, yeah, so there's a lot of pressure. You know, if, if people aren't familiar, and I can't say I am, to be honest, with, with the Bach's St John work, Passion, yes. you know, mm. um, why, why is it so difficult to sing? Is it because it's sort of in a very high range? or is it... it's, a bit of, it's a bit of all of that. It's... Uh, it's, it's rather like, you know, if you're a, a runner, you go for a run around the park, that's easy. But if you run a, a marathon, that's much more challenging. So this, this is, is a just, marathon. It's the scale of it. It's huge. Mm. But it's also, the subject matter is, is deep. It's about life and death and joy and hope. It's not, just, it's not just one thing. It's a long, beautiful piece of music. Well, you're asking for trouble. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it, I was certainly looking for people that were up for a challenge who could already sing and who were... We're going to go on this journey of uh, really of self-discovery. Right, um, Julian, are you a classical fan? Well, my mother was very keen to give us cultural education, so we did go and see. I asked you earlier who did the Alleluia. That was uh, Handel. We went yes. to see that and, and the Enigma so variations and things. Oh God, lovely. Yeah. Did you have a premonition about being a conductor? Uh, I, I remember when I was about 16 or 17 joining a choir and seeing the, the guy in front and thinking, that's a job I would like the to do. The boss. Just the control, <laughs> the power. Yeah, yeah the it's, power. it's a wonderful thing. There it's just a go. great thing to be involved in. Uh, well, we don't want to give too much away about the kind of eight singers you've got in the choir, but there was one in particular, a drag artist from yes. Port Talbot. Um, he had some challenges to overcome, didn't he? Yeah, he sure did. Jake is a, a wonderful character, uh, but uh, is uh, partially sighted, so sight... Sight is a really, a really big issue, and with a piece of music that is two hours long, he needed to be able to read oh. through this giant score. So uh, I had to work out a way to get a tablet in front of him so that he could still sing round the corner. But he dealt with it with the most amazing. You know, the rest of us we were so worried about offending him or putting him under unnecessary pressure, mm. but he would just took it in his stride. And you know, his whole life has been dealing with this challenge, and this was just another aspect of it. But he overcame it, maybe a little slower than the others. And he got there, got to the finish can, line. Can I, you know, two and a half hours mm. of singing is... I mean, that's... that's yeah, it's not singing all the way through. I mean, there's a, there's a huge team. There's soloists that yeah. come in, there's the orchestral moments. Uh, but, yeah, there is a lot. It's physically demanding. That's it's like thinking. being an athlete. You have to... You have to train for it. Yeah. And the reason, really, we love these programmes, isn't it, Julian? Because, you know, the, the challenge is kind of the vehicle, really, but it's about getting to know the characters Definitely. and, the are, you know, what makes them tick and all the rest the of it. people are everything in this. You it's had, a challenge for me, but it's a challenge for them as well. Exactly, and you had, you had eight brilliant people taking part. Who will stay in your mind? I think Joy made the biggest sort of transformation. She came to it having, you know, it's obviously a piece of music that is about the Easter story. And Joy had uh, a really difficult relationship with the church. She had uh, come out 
uh, as a young woman and had been rejected by her church and told that she was sort of damned oh. for all eternity. And I think had really struggled with that through her whole life. And coming, uh, coming back to that story through this music, coming back to singing as well, she'd, she'd not sung since her mother had died. And uh, I think that, that was really powerful to watch her sense of growth through this because this is the kind of music that can do that it's, it's it, it connects with your heart cathartic for her probably very cathartic yeah, yeah for her for me for anyone i think that this music touches mm. well, now, get, my it, tissues ready. get the tissues ready <laughs> oh. uh, in choirs that i i've seen gareth i mean there's usually in choirs you've seen yeah i've been to church for a couple of times i, thought I, yeah. Which yeah. Choir? I have seen a few choirs over the years you'd be surprised to know okay. mrs jones Good. but what i would say is that there's the powerful singers and yes. then maybe the, the, the ones that are less powerful that you need to kind of protect with i mean look at this question you can tell i've been to see a few uh, choirs <laughs> over the years the point i'm getting to is you have a, a a way don't you of finding out who has these great voices with a, a particular song that we all know I, I do tend to ask people to sing happy birthday because oh. it's actually much more difficult than a lot of people think. Agree. It's the happy birthday. Oh, yeah. That bit. People You're get good it. At happy happy birthday. Birthday. No, yeah. so the, the, <laughs> is that your the thing with happy birthday, you start off and you all gusto. Yeah. Go win for it, and then you 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 pull back. That's because you get to the name the and you don't know who it is. <laughs> people start it in the wrong key. Happy birthday to happy birthday. And then you're it doesn't matter though, does it? Really? Not really. Can you imagine but that at a birthday? It's, it's, a good way to, it's a good way to hear people, hear whether or not people can see the pictures in their mind or if they're just sort of guessing. I, I, see. I was in yes. a choir once and I used to just pretend to sing at the back. <laughs> you would have noticed. Same. I would have noticed. Yeah. Yeah. Same, a bit of miming. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, well, Gareth Malone's Easter Passion is on Good Friday at 11.15, then on Easter Sunday at 11.30, both on BBC One, and the big concert will also be shown on Easter Sunday at 6 o'clock on BBC Two. It will indeed. Right, and everything will be available to watch on BBC iPlayer from 12.15 on Good Friday. Uh, OK, in just a moment, Sarah Cox will be telling us what inspired her to go from reviewing books to writing them. She's just come down off air, apparently. She actually, has. Well. She's, She's ready here. to come and join us. Right then, we are delighted to say oh. that Sarah Cox has joined us straight after finishing a Radio 2 show. Hard work, <laughs> Um, thank you for coming at the end of a long shift already. It's fine, I just had to jump in the lift. It's brilliant. <laughs> it's I ideal. Don't yeah. I put on a long record and went and changed my top. It was great. Did you? Yeah. Yeah. All the secrets now. <laughs> do. All the secrets. I got the tube. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know that we are big fans of Between the Covers. Yes. Brilliant show. So good. It's back um, in October. Oh, I love it. But you are also now a proper author. Yeah, it's my um, third book, six exactly. I know, Way Back is the new one, and it's dedicated to farmers. Yes. And we meet a character called Josie in it. And I don't know how much you want to say, but Josie, she swaps, doesn't she, city life... Yes. ..for country life. Yes. ..dot, dot, dot. Mm. She's, yeah, she's just feeling like she's a little bit rudderless. She doesn't really know what her purpose in life is. Yeah. And she realises, through a few different circumstances, that she needs to go back to the village where she was raised and the farm where she was born to make sense of where she is in her life now and to unpick her quite tricky relationship with her mother, who's a right piece of work. And along the way, she makes some great friends. I love writing funny women and I love writing about female friendships because I'm sure you've got your gang of yeah. best girl mates and I love surrounding my characters with supportive women who, who are cheerleaders. And you can hear, the, that's why I think the voices, you can hear them so clearly because they are like girls we all no. Yeah, who yeah. are just supportive and just and also funny. Mm. And there's some there's some good men in there. There's a hot farmer. Um, oh, yeah. Some good men. There's so, Not a some lot. good men. No, I mean, <laughs> no, no there's a couple, but yeah. good in different ways. Yeah, we'll good say. Diff yeah, different ways. Yeah. A nice yeah. uh, ex-husband. There's a chimney sweep, if that's your vibe. Julian's in now. <laughs> um, you, your dad was a farmer. Sarah, yeah, he's here. still a farmer. He's got a hair. Oh, he is. Yeah, he's up in. He's up in Bolton. Uh, has he read the book? Did he think no. it was authentic enough of well, life as a farmer? 
or on be the farm? Because he is a farmer, it's too busy to read, oh, basically. Okay. So that's why I dedicated it to British farmers, because they work they so, work so hard. hard. Yeah. Um, but yeah, my memoir was about growing up on the farm, and I kind of told him about it. He's like, oh yeah, lovely, I'll read it at some point. <laughs> um, but my mum's my mom's a big fan of, of my work, but I think that's because she's my mum. Uh, and she always reads everything and checks everything, and oh, you know, okay. and I get a bit I get a bit of help from my dad and from my big brother with, with all the details and stuff. Yeah. Nice. And it is really uplifting and super funny, but of course there are some subjects in there that are yeah. tougher, like child poverty and mental health. Was it important to kind of balance the light and the shade a bit in the book? Yeah, a little bit. I think when you start writing a book, you don't think, oh, I'm going to tackle these subjects and this needs exploring. But you just find that your character... Sounds a bit fancy, of this. Your character kind of takes you there and before you know it, her story starts to blossom in front of your eyes and you're like, OK, maybe this happened yeah. to her as a, as a child and maybe she's struggling with this. And, and I, 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 you know, I sort of influenced a little bit by my own childhood. We weren't poor. It wasn't like Angela's ashes, all right, don't worry. <laughs> it was fine. But, you know, but we, were working, we were working class and we were, you know, and I think it's, you know, it sort of fills out the characters and before you know it, you are touching on subjects like, you know, depression, and yeah. struggle with alcohol and all sorts of different issues. Yeah. Can, I, can I ask quickly, has it got easier writing? Because, you know, like since that first one, because I know there's a few people out there that would love to write a book, and it's just that first bit of pen to paper moment. It's exactly that, you're right. People, it does get easier and you need to just have a go because yeah. you've got nothing to lose. So open up your little laptop and just have a little yeah. go, make a few notes and who knows? It does use a different bit of your brain. Yeah. It is incredibly, it's frustrating, but also it's really rewarding yeah. as well. Because I loved your first one, but you can see now you're fully formed as an author. This one is excellent. Th thank you, yeah. Alex. Thank you. I'm going to... You? Can I, yeah. Put that on the back. I was just going to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's just legally binding. There Can I have that yeah. for the cover, have please, it for Alex free. Jones of the one show? Thank you very much. <laughs> and you, you present on uh, Morning Live, of course, our sister yes. show. And James Greenwood, lovely vet James Greenwood, he was good, wasn't he, for a bit of advice and he, a bit of you yeah, know, research? Yeah, he, he was amazing. So there is... Um, there, I don't think this is a plot spoiler. There's a moment where a pig uh, goes oh. into labour and even though my dad had pigs in the 70s obviously I was way too young to remember properly yeah. so I, I got onto the blower to James and was like help me out is this realistic so I sent some scenes to him and he would say yeah this oh. this was good and and there, there was other scenes that I'd remember like cattle auctions and things like that I can remember you know the hell <laughs> and all that so I, I remembered all that but Did yeah you write James all was that great down? yeah it was <laughs> quite hard to spell it there <laughs> 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 I nailed it. <laughs> um, well, Way Back is out tomorrow. It is indeed. Uh, we've got some comments here. Uh, Helen says, uh, I was lucky enough to interview Julian uh, backstage at the Grand Theatre in Swansea about 35 years ago uh, and taped it from a hospital radio show. I was terribly nervous, but he was lovely. Oh, well, that's, oh. that's turned out well then, hasn't it? And <laughs> lots and lots of people looking forward yeah. to the documentary yeah. on Paul as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, and thanks for all our guests tonight, it's been brilliant. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow with Kate Garraway, actor Dev Patel and Olympic skateboarder Sky Brown. We'll see you then, bye-bye. Good night. Bye.